Uh, let me thank Stanley King, who is the director of the Madison Square Boys and Girls Club. I'm here with Melissa DeRosa to my right and Gareth Rhodes to my left. It's a pleasure to be back in Brooklyn. Spent a lot of time here. My grandparents are here. I'm from a mixed marriage in New York City. My mother was from Brooklyn. My father was from Queens. So I spent a lot of time here, and it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, and you'll understand why we're in Brooklyn in a moment. Let's talk about where we are today. Fact by fact, across the morass, we're all trying to find our way through this. And uh, following the facts are the way we have chosen to do it in the great state of New York. Facts today are good. The total number of hospitalizations are down. The rolling total is down. Uh, the change in intubations, people who are put on ventilators is down, so that's very good news. And the number of new COVID cases per day is also down, 163. Uh, which is the lowest that has been. So that is all very, very good news uh, from our point of view. Uh, the relatively positive news is the number of deaths uh, continues to decline, 74. This is always painful. Uh, and we're going to be watching this number to see how far down it actually goes. We have a large state. Uh, and the COVID virus tends to at attract, attack those uh, who are seniors and those who have underlying illnesses uh, and will remain a cause of death for the foreseeable future, I'm afraid to say. Uh, but we want to get this number down as low as possible, and we're doing everything that we can to do that. We have the best hospitals, the best doctors, the best nurses. Uh, they're all working day and night. Uh, so we can take a little solace in the fact that we know we have done everything we can uh, to help save those 74 lives. You can't always be successful, but you can always do uh, the most that you can do, and that's what we're doing. Uh, and you see, again, the number of lives lost and how that number is coming down, so that is all good news. Yesterday I was in Washington, D.C., spoke to a lot of people, I met with the president, spoke to congressional members, spoke to uh, Senate members to try to find out what was going on. This is my opinion, so it's worth what you pay for it, since you're not paying anything. Uh, I understand what states must do to work their way through this pandemic. The states are taking the lead in the responsibility. I understand that. I understand what governors must do. Uh, I, I am vice chairman of what's called the National Governors Association, so I work with governors all across the nation. Uh, and uh, we talk about our responsibilities, and uh, I feel good about what the states and what the governors are doing. My question is, what is Washington going to do, the federal government, because they have a role also in this? Uh, yes, the states are in charge, and yes, the states are implementing their plans, but we need support from the federal government, and that's the role of the federal government. Uh, Washington has passed numerous pieces of legislation, and they've successfully bailed out big corporations. They passed pieces of legislation that have a lot of benefits for uh, the rich and the powerful. Uh, now, the question is, what is Washington going to do in terms of passing legislation that helps working Americans, right? Uh, police officers, firefighters, school teachers, hospitals, uh, unemployed people, businesses that are struggling. Uh, how do we help them? How do we bring them up? And that's uh, what states do and local governments do, and that's state and local government funding, and they have to provide that. Uh, also, my opinion is Washington should, uh, just for this once, end their proclivity to make every piece of legislation pork barrel legislation. Uh, I understand they have to get senators to vote for it, and they have to get House members to vote for it, but that doesn't mean they have to make it a gravy train of pork just to pass it. Maybe you can just pass a bill on the merits of a bill. How about that? Novel, uh, but possible. This is supposed to be a specifically targeted piece of legislation to help restore the economy and repair the damage of the COVID virus. Well, then make the legislation about funding to repair the COVID virus. 
And you know where the COVID virus has been in this country. You know where it's wreaking havoc. You can, can count the number of deaths and where they are. You can count the number of positive cases and where they are. You look at the past legislation that came out of Washington and how they dispersed money, and you look at how they wound up making it a gravy train. And uh, every state got a lot of money, local governments got a lot of money, and in many cases disconnected from the COVID virus and the COVID situation. If you take the total funding and you actually look at how much states got per co positive COVID case, uh, it's not even close. Uh, some states got millions of dollars per COVID case. New York State, we got about $23,000 per case. New Jersey, we got about $27,000 per case. I understand they have to, quote unquote, buy votes on a piece of legislation. Uh, I also understand it's taxpayers' money, and uh, theoretically, a legislator is there to do what's right, uh, and uh, not because that legislator was, uh, was seduced with large amounts of taxpayer dollars, even though that state wasn't affected. Uh, I also think Washington has an opportunity to actually step up and to uh, be smart for a change. They should be talking about revitalizing the economy, not just reopening the economy. I don't believe you just reopen the economy and it bounces back uh, for everyone. I think it bounces back for the big corporations. I think it bounces back for the rich. I think it bounces back for the powerful. That's what happened after the 2008 financial crisis, the mortgage fraud crisis. The big banks that caused the crisis, they were fine just months afterwards. They took all that federal bailout money. They gave themselves bonuses. I remember I was the attorney general of New York. I chased those corporations to put the bonuses back. Uh, but how about the small businesses that closed? How about the corporations that are going to lay off workers now? What's going to happen to them? Uh, how about all those blue-collar jobs that are not going to come back right away? All those little retail stores that are not going to come back right away. So it's not just about revitalizing. Uh, not just about reopening, it's about revitalizing. And it's about having a plan and a vision for the future. Okay, we went through this. What's the plan going forward? We went through the Depression. But there was a plan afterwards. We went through World War II, but there was a plan to restore the economy. Where's the plan? Where's the vision? Where's the plan to say, yes, we went through hell, but heaven is on the other side, and we're going to rally, and we're going to be better for this. BBB, build back better. We're not just going to return to where we were. We're going to be better than ever before and to make sure that any of those corporations that took taxpayer money rehire the same number of workers. You hear these corporations now talking about, well, we're going to take this opportunity to restructure. We're going to get lean. You know what that means? That means they're going to lay off workers. That means they're going to boost their profits and their stock price by laying off workers and not rehiring people after the pandemic. Now, that's a corporation's right, but you don't have to subsidize that with government money, right? You shouldn't be giving them government cash, and then they lay off workers, and then the taxpayer has to pay unemployment for the workers they laid off. That would be a scandal, right? Well, if they don't stop it, it's going to happen here. Uh, and if they were smart, they'd finally rebuild the infrastructure in this nation, which they've been talking about for 30, 40 years, and they've never done. You want to put people to work, build airports, build bridges, put technology in education, put technology in health care, do the things you've talked about for 40 years, uh, but the government was never competent enough to do. Uh, and also, to Washington, after my conversations, uh, so much of it is, uh, well, here's our politics, here's our politics. Forget your politics, just put it all aside. Uh, there's, a, there's a greater interest than your politics, uh, and that's doing the right thing for this country and for your constituents, and stop the hyper 
partisan attitude and the, the gridlock. Forget the red and the blue. We are red, white, and blue. We're all Americans. That's my opinion. Back to the facts. We're going to focus on the opening of New York City. We have reopened the other regions of the state. Uh, we divided the state into different regions because the state has dramatically different facts across the state. We're in New York City, one of the densest urban areas on the globe. Uh, we have parts of upstate New York, which are rural areas, uh, which look more like the Midwest, and they had facts more like the Midwest. So we divided the state into regions and uh, addressing the facts in each region. The other regions have all started reopening. Uh, New York City, where we had a much higher number of cases uh, than anywhere else in the state, anywhere else in the country, uh, than many countries on the globe. And New York City is a, a more difficult situation. Uh, we were attacked in New York City by the coronavirus from Europe. I like to say that because people say, what do you mean the coronavirus from Europe? I thought the coronavirus was from China. Yeah, so did I. So did everyone. That's what we were told. The coronavirus was coming from China. Uh, what we weren't told was the coronavirus left China, went to Europe, January, February, and then came here from Europe. Oh, nobody told us. I know nobody told us. They say nobody knew. I don't know how nobody knew, but the cases came from Europe. January, January, February, March, three million people traveled from Europe to JFK and Newark Airport. Why did New York City have so many cases? Because three million Europeans came January, February, March and brought the virus and nobody knew and nobody told us. No fault of our own. There's nothing endemic to New York City. Yeah, we have density. But we're all watching China, we're looking to the West, and the virus came from the East. It came from Europe, uh, and that's been documented now. So we were the hardest hit, but we're going to reopen as the smartest. And if you look at the curve in New York right now, you see our numbers are going down. You see the curve in many other states, other, many other parts of the country, you still have the curve going up. Uh, so, we did get hit the hardest, but we learned. The state has a set of rules and metrics to reopen that apply to New York City just like they apply to every other region. Why? Because what is safe to reopen in Buffalo is the same standard that is safe to reopen in Albany or Long Island or New York City. Uh, I'm not going to open any region that I don't believe is safe. And uh, we have different standards across the nation. Different states have taken different standards. Uh, you can argue about whether or not we should have different standards of safety in this nation. But uh, that's above my pay grade. I can tell you in this state, there are no different standards of safety. What is safe to reopen uh, is safe. And if it's safe for your family, it's safe for my family. And I wouldn't reopen an area that I didn't consider was safe for my family. Uh, that's, my, that's my personal gauge. So it's the same all across the board with the same rules. Phase one reopening is construction, manufacturing, uh, curbside retail by specific guidelines. The other regions have all hit phase one. New York City has yet, yet to hit phase one, but that's what we are pointing towards. And then once you hit phase one, you continue to monitor the metrics. If all is good, you move to phase two accordingly. But it is about the metrics. It is about rate of hospitalization, number of hospital beds, number of ICU beds, what's happening, happening on the testing, what's happening on the symptoms, that people are reporting, and you monitor those metrics, those facts, and you proceed accordingly. New York City, we have to uh, make more progress 
on some of the metrics. We have to make more progress on what's called contact tracing, which is very important. Uh, after you test, whoever winds up positive, you trace back those contacts and you isolate. In New York City, you also have the added situation of uh, public transportation. For New York City to reopen, you have uh, working New Yorkers who commute on mass transit. And we have to be able to have a mass transit system that is safe, that is clean, uh, and is not overcrowded. And the MTA has uh, really taken the bull by the horns on this one. We never heard of disinfecting a train. Uh, we heard of cleaning trains, and then we could de debate whether or not the trains were that clean. But to get them to a point where they're disinfected was a higher level, a higher standard than anyone ever dreamed of. They're now disinfecting every train and every bus on a daily basis. Uh, they're piloting the use of UV light technology to kill viruses in subway cars. Uh, so they're using the best science uh, to get ready for this. In the meantime, we want to focus on New York City hotspots. Because if you look at New York City, there are very different stories within the city. And we now do enough testing. We do tens of thousands of tests per day. We are doing more testing in New York State than any state in the country. We're doing more testing in New York State per capita than any country on the globe, okay? So we're the testing capital. When you do that many tests, you can target exactly where people are getting sick uh, and where those new cases are coming from. And what you can look at that by neighborhood, by zip code, and what you see is uh, more of the cases are coming from outer borough communities, more minority communities, lower income communities, uh, new hospitalizations coming from people who are not currently working. They're not essential workers. They're communities where essential workers live, uh, but they're not the essential workers. Uh, it's more from what we call community spread. Uh, it's in communities that have an underlying health care disparity, which is a problem across this country. Uh, populations that have uh, higher incidence of underlying illnesses uh, and lack of masks, social distancing, particularly with younger people. Uh, if you look at the testing results, for example, you have communities that have double the infection rate of the city in general. So the city in general is about 20% infection rate. Uh, you have communities that are literally more than double, 43% infection rate. Uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn, 41% infection rate. Uh, East Bronx, 38% infection rate. Soundview, Bruckner section of the Bronx, 38% infection rate. Hollis, Queens, my old neighborhood, 35% infection rate. Flatbush, Brooklyn, 45%. Uh, infection rate, and that's why we're here today. Uh, you know these communities have a higher infection rate. You know the new cases that are being generated tend to come from these communities. Well, then target those communities, right? That's part of being smart. Uh, get them help and get them help faster and address the health care inequality that is underlying all of this. So bring in more diagnostic testing, more antibody testing, more PPE, more healthcare services for the underlying illnesses. That's where the comorbidities come from. Bring in more supplies and bring in more communication. We're doing all of the above. We're taking on the issue of inequality when it comes to healthcare and we're going to take on uh, the challenge of the most impacted communities in terms of COVID. We're working with Northwell Health Systems. Northwell is the largest health system in the state. Uh, it's a great organization, and they're going to bring more health care services uh, to the impacted communities in New York City that we're talking about. We're up to now 225 testing sites. Uh, I just passed one on the way here today. 
Many of these testing sites are underused. We have testing sites, drive-through sites that can do 15,000 tests a day. They're only doing 5,000 tests a day. Uh, there is no cost to the test. It does not hurt. It is pain-free. I did the test on live TV, didn't flinch. Uh, it's just a nasal swab. There's no needle. You can go to the website, coronavirus.health.ny.gov, and find the site near you. Get tested. Get tested. If you have a symptom, get tested. If you were exposed to a person who was positive, get tested. It's no cost. It doesn't hurt. Uh, and uh, there are sites literally uh, everywhere throughout the city. Uh, we've delivered more than 8 million masks across New York City to public housing, food banks, churches, and homeless shelters. The masks work. They work. Uh, and we have to culturalize the masks. We have to customize the masks for New York to get New Yorkers to wear them. We're bringing 1 million additional masks today. And today I'm signing an executive order that authorizes private businesses to deny entrance to people who do not wear a mask or a face covering. I have been working to communicate this message about masks and how effective they are. Uh, they are deceptively effective. Uh, they are amazingly effective. And we've made them mandatory in public settings, public transportation, et cetera. Uh, but when we're talking about reopening stores and places of business, we're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. Uh, that store owner has a right to protect themselves. That store owner has a right to protect the other patrons in that store. You don't want to wear a mask? Fine. But you don't have a right to then go into that store if that store owner doesn't want you to. And we'll sign that executive order. And in general, more communication, more education about the availability and importance of testing, diagnostic testing, antibody testing, uh, wearing the PPE, why social distancing makes sense. Uh, and communicating this to people. And my main job all through this has been communications. This was not a task government could ever accomplish. Uh, I knew that from day one. I know what government can do. I know what government can't do. Uh, tell 19 million people in the state of New York that they have to stay home. Government can't do that. I can say it, but we'd have no way to enforce it. It's up to what people do. And people, especially New Yorkers, they're going to do what they want to do. They're going to do what's smart if you give them the information, if they believe you, if the information convinces them. But they're going to do what they're going to do. So. My job from day one has been communicating the facts to people so people can make a smart judgment for themselves. So people had the information to protect themselves, to protect their family, to decide what was smart. That's my job as governor. That's what I've been doing. That's what I continue to do. I'm still trying to communicate to people how important it is to take tests and wear masks, etc. I have, at times, been frustrated that not everybody seems to get it. I have my three girls at home, as you know. Family keeps us grounded. You know, family always has a way of bringing you back to reality. My girls have been very good at telling me that when I raise the frustration of communication, they say, well, it's, it's you, Dad. It's, you're the one who's not communicating. They've had many helpful hints as to why I haven't been able to communicate effectively or, or to the level I would like to, uh, that I'm not cool enough. I think I'm cool. Look, I'm wearing a cool mask. I don't have enough edge. One of them said I don't have enough edge to communicate effectively. So I'm trying different ways. Uh, they didn't like the state advertising. We're now doing different state advertising. But I understand that I need reinforcements and I need help in communication. 
uh, especially when I'm in Brooklyn. Even though I'm half from Brooklyn, that doesn't matter when you're from Brooklyn. They want a full-fledged uh, Brooklyn voice if they're going to listen to a, a Brooklyn uh, voice of authority. So I'm going to bring in reinforcements uh, to help us communicate that message, and I'm, I'm pleased to have them with us today. And I want to thank very much uh, two great New Yorkers, uh, two great uh, performers, Chris Rock and Rosie Perez, who are going to join us. And I want to thank them very much. They're going to help communicate this. They're going to do advertisements for the state. And uh, they're going to help communicate this message that uh, it's important for an individual's health, for a family's health, and it's important for all our health. We're one family in New York, one family in Brooklyn, one family in Queens, one family in New York City, and do it for the good of the family. Rosie, it's great to be with you again. Chris, I'm so glad that you're here. You. I can't thank you guys enough, uh, and we'd love to hear from you, whichever one wants to start. Um, Ladies? Oh, thank you, Chris. You go. He's such a gentleman. What a gentleman. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor, and it's really good to be here with my friend, my fellow Brooklynite, Chris Rock, and of course, our fantastic governor, Cuomo, who has been such an amazing leader during this crisis. You know, and I'm proud to be partnering with the governor to make sure that my hometown, my borough, my beloved borough, Brooklyn, and all of New York, most impacted communities have their resources. They need to stop the spread of this virus and to help spread the word about what we all have to do to beat this virus. In Brooklyn, there's a saying, spread love the Brooklyn way. And I want to extend that to not just the uh, out of boroughs, to the tri-state area, but to all of America and to all the world. Spreading love the Brooklyn way means respecting your neighbors respecting your communities. And the way you can do that is to by getting tested, wearing a mask. That says, I love you and you love me. I respect you and you respect me back. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care who you're going to vote for. All I care is that we get out of this pandemic as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. Over 100,000 deaths is just incredibly heartbreaking. And we can, we can lower these numbers. We're already doing it. And I wish the media would show how effective the governor has been in spreading this message of wearing a mask and keeping social distancing. And for those who are not adhering to the guidelines, just know that you're not just disrespecting yourself. You're disrespecting your loved ones, your communities, your neighbors, everyone. So please spread love the Brooklyn way. Get tested. Wear a mask and let's help fight this virus. We could do it. We could, we could do it. We will rise up. We will stand up. Brooklyn, stand up. New York, stand up. America, please stand up and be safe. Thank you so much. And yeah. I just want to say that our governor is a rock star, and he makes me proud to be from New York. Oh, thank you very much. You guys are the rock stars. I'm just a fan. Thank you so much. Rosie, thank you so much. Chris? I, thank uh, yes, thank you. You, I watch you every single day, and you, you bring me calm. You know, you bring me joy. Didn't Aretha, <laughs> Anita Baker sing that? You bring me joy every single thank day. Because I don't know what's going on. I thought I lived in the United States. I thought I lived in a country, and now I realize there, we have 50 countries, <laughs> essentially. Right now, we're in the country of New York. Um, I, you know, I want to say, I, I got the test today. I just got tested to come out here. Uh, I got a 65, so just, <laughs> just passed. Just, just passed. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, you know, we haven't been able to perform or do any shows or anything. I'm just, so, I'm looking at this microphone right yeah. here. I'm like, wow. I just wanna, good. Can I just say hi, microphone? I really missed you. I know it's been hard, but we're going to get back together at some point, and it's going to be even better than the last time, microphone. I will never take you for granted. Uh, we need, people need to get tested, and people need to 
to make it a festive occasion. They need to posse up and get tested. Like all the crew is getting tested. And the family should get tested. And, you know, if you love your grandmother, if you love your, your, your elderly mother, your elderly anybody, you should get tested. This is, and it's not just, you know, it's wherever there are poor people, really. It's wherever people are congested. So, yes, it's in East New York. Yes, it's in Brownsville. But, you know, it's also in Garrison Beach. It's also in Marine Park. It's also, you know, so everybody that can get tested should get tested as soon as possible. And I'm just so, you know, governor called me up and I'm here to do whatever is required. And, you know, I, I hope to God that when this is over, you're still a part of the government. I don't, I don't, I hope this isn't the last, <laughs> it's like, oh, it's over. No, I hope this keeps going on. I hope so, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad. That would be bad. Oh, excuse me, uh, Governor. Uh, I also would like to say that to mi gente, oye, wear a mask, please. The numbers in our communities are staggering. This is not a joke. This is not a hoax. This is real. This is real deal Holyfield. So please, mi gente, love each other and love yourselves. Get tested, wear a mask. Get tested, wear a mask. It's like uh, when the doctor prescribes antibiotics. He says, take the whole prescription, and if you stop, whatever you came in there for is going to come back worse. So social distancing is what was the prescription, and we need to take the whole dose, or else it's going to get worse. So true. So well said. And look, it is a new thing, right? Uh, this wear a mask thing. It, it's, it's just a couple of months when you think about it. Uh, nobody heard about it before that. You'd watch TV once in a while, you'd see people in China wearing masks, but nobody did it here, right? So it's, it is introducing a whole new concept to people. Uh, and it's not only making it okay, it's, it's making it not okay to not wear a mask. Not wearing a mask is not okay. And that has to be the culture, and that has to be the attitude. It's not okay if you don't wear a mask. It's not okay for you to jeopardize my health. I don't think it's right for you to jeopardize your health, but that's your health. Uh, and by the way, you jeopardize your health, you also jeopardize the health of your family when you go home and whoever else you're interacting with, but you don't have a right to jeopardize my health. So it is, as Rosie said, it's respect, uh, it's civic duty, it's humanity, it is New York. You know, New York is, New York is uh, 19 million people who start with the premise we can all live together in a very close area, right? Part of that acknowledgement is we're going to respect one another and we're going to respect each other's space. And add, we're going to respect each other's air to respecting each other's space, right? We're going to respect each other's air. Wear a mask. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Chris. Questions? Governor, I want to get the uh, status on this bill the mayor is seeking regarding uh, $7 billion he wants in borrowing. My understanding is you probably know the bill was laid aside by the assembly. Is your sense that something can be negotiated here? Like, would you like to see the city come up with an austerity plan, perhaps enact the Financial Control Board to have some controls? Or do you, would you rather just not see this bill pass now? Um, you, I haven't had any serious conversations with the legislature on it, uh, but you'd have to have serious conversations, right? Um, the first question is, how much aid do we get from Washington that we're working on? That's why I was there yesterday. That's what. I was making the point against state and local aid. What does the state get? What do the local governments get? What does the city get? Uh, after you f find out what that fact is, what's the shortfall, and what are you going to do about it? Uh, borrowing for operating expenses is a, is a risky proposition, and it has to be done with caution, if at all. Uh, because now you're really rolling the dice on future revenues. And 
uh, the, the reason the state has to be concerned. And I think the Senate, uh, I spoke to some senators, uh, state senators, who frankly uh, were very smart about this. And they were talking about the history. Look, we've been through this. When you have a local government that basically goes bankrupt, the state has to step in and then puts in a financial control board. We went through this with Erie County, where there's a financial control board. We went through it with Nassau County, where there's a control board. Yonkers, there's a control board. Uh, New York City, we went through this situation in the 70s, uh, where New York City was basically bankrupt. The state had to step in. So first question is, how much money do we get from Washington? Hopefully, they do the semi-responsible thing. Uh, but the second question is going to be, once you know what the Washington uh, uh, funding is going to be, how do you make up the shortfall? And there will be a shortfall. But that's a very serious conversation because making up the shortfall is causing you, forcing you to estimate future revenues. When does the economy come back for New York City? Six months, nine months, a year, 18 months, two years? And that's, that's a challenging conversation at best. So I don't know. Uh, I think the legislature and I think the Senate did the responsible thing. They would have to do it now. In other words, they're scheduled to go out of session, as you know. Presumably they could come back in September or earlier than that. Would you rather see it taken up then and when we know what happens? Well, they want to know what happens with Washington because they're in the same position with the state budget, right? I haven't made any state budget decisions because I want to see what happens with the Washington funding before you get to step two. Finish step one, then go to step two. Uh, what's my state budget going to look like? I can tell you what it looks like if I don't get funding from Washington. 20% cut on schools, 20% cut on hospitals, 20% cut on local governments. But let's see what happens with Washington. And we haven't done that with the legislature, so I think it's the same for the Nassau budget or New York City budget or Erie budget. Can you clarify exactly what is the guidance now to get tested? Is it asymptomatic and also symptomatic? And are you talking about antibody testing or the testing for when you're ill? And then can I ask you a second follow-up? Why wasn't the mayor here today? When was the last time you talked to him directly? Don't you think that getting on the same page with him would help clarify for New Yorkers what the guidance is towards reopening? Yeah. First, there is, we're, uh, we're on totally the same page because it's only one page. I don't know where you see different pages, right? There's state guidelines, period, and that's it. So there's only one page, so you can't be on a different page when you only have one page. Uh, the mayor has his schedule. I have my schedule. I talk to him uh, all the time. So, but there's only one page. And the guidance on testing, just uh, the what, guidance what, on the, can you get The guidance on testing on is uh, on the website, but it's now so broad, it's... If you have any symptoms, which are basically flu-like symptoms, so if you cough, you sneeze, you have a fever, any symptoms, you're exposed to a person who was COVID, you're an essential worker, uh, frontline worker, healthcare worker, you're going to be in a retail store where you may be open to the public, uh, it's virtually open. But not asymptomatic people are still not being recommended. Well, asymptomatic who, if you're an essential worker or you're at a retail store, then yes. Uh, you met the president yesterday to talk about infrastructure. One of the things that came up was the fast tracking of LaGuardia Air Train. Did you also talk about fast tracking congestion pricing out of the USDOT? Uh, if not, why not? We've talked about that issue. Uh, I was talking about primarily job creating activities yesterday. So LaGuardia Air Train would create jobs, also create an air train, which we need. Uh, the Cross Harbor Tunnels creates jobs, uh, et cetera. So we were focusing on job creation, Second Avenue Subway, which is in Manhattan, goes up Second Avenue. Uh, congestion pricing, we've spoken about a number of times. That's not necessarily a job creator, but it is very important for the city and the state, and it requires a federal sign-off that we're still waiting for. Federal sign-off yesterday, I mean. Isn't that helpful? I have spoken to him about that on previous occasions. But yesterday, uh, there was a discussion on different topics, which is job generation. In terms of the executive order, why the decision on the executive order would be concerned about conflicts that arise when a store owner says, keep out? 
Yeah. Yeah, you could have, you know, it's New York. You can have a conflict if you say good morning, right? So, uh, but you have a private store, on, a store owner. It's a private store. He's the store owner. He, by executive order, has the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. Uh, you don't have a right to expose the store owner to a virus. You don't have that constitutional right. Uh, you don't have a right to uh, expose the other patrons in the store to the virus. You don't have a right to walk into a store and cause all the other patrons to run out because you're wearing a mask, not wearing a mask. You don't have that right. So, uh, yeah, could you somebody complain to the store owner, I think I should have the right to come in, even though I don't have a mask? Somebody can say that. That person would be wrong, but they could say it. I have two questions, though. The first is, how much of a heads up will New York City get before we're reopening? Will it be like, all right, well, New York City will open in two days, for instance? And the other question is, do you have any thoughts on what's going on in Minneapolis right now? We talk to the city multiple times a day, so, uh, and we're, we have one set of state numbers and guidelines and metrics, et cetera, so we're all watching the same numbers, et cetera. Uh, so there's no surprise because it's, we're literally in constant contact. Uh, I think the situation was so disturbing and ugly uh, and frightening. It was just frightening that a law enforcement officer anywhere in this country could act that way, especially after everything we've learned you know, sometimes you say you rationalize in your own mind, well, this is terrible, but we'll learn from it. How many times do we have to learn the same lesson? I mean, we went through it in New York. We had the Garner case in New York. It's happened all across the country. How many times do you have to learn the same lesson? Uh, and look, a prosecutor will, will do the case. Um, I was a prosecutor, I was the attorney general, I don't prejudge a case, maybe there are facts that I don't know, but I'll tell you if I was a prosecutor, I would look at, be looking at that case from the first moment, because I think there's a criminal case there. Um, Does anyone want to add anything, Rosie, Chris? Governor, uh, Luis. You said that you were waiting on clarity from the federal government for federal funding before making any decisions on state budget cuts. But as you wait, which could be a while, has the state taken any measures to control spending, whether it be hiring freezes, not renewing contracts, uh, delaying payments? Yes, all of the above. All of the above. Look, whatever the federal government does, there's still going to be a shortfall, right? Uh, well, let me take that back. Maybe the federal government becomes enlightened and responsible and actually funds the amount necessary to close the gap, which would be smart and right. Uh, but if they don't do that, there'll be a shortfall. We're preparing for a shortfall and reducing expenses uh, all across the board. And just to add to that, the governor did um, do an order, and I believe it was at the end of March when everything first started happening, we did an across-the-board hiring freeze. We asked our labor brothers and sisters to forego the increases in their salaries that were guaranteed by their contracts, which they all agreed to do, um, and that includes the 2% increase for management confidential workers. So we have taken those steps. Does that include layoffs? And a second question, because that's just a follow-up to his. Have you been following the city's plans to reopen, like restaurants putting tables outside, the stock exchange telling employees not to take mass transit? So what are your thoughts on those plans, and do you think that those are going in the right direction? Yeah. Let me just uh, a follow-up question is still a question. So it was still two. <laughs> but that's okay. I just... <laughs> Thanks. I like that, though. Follow, that's why it's in New York City. It was a follow-up, doesn't count as a question. The, we haven't done any layoffs. Uh, we hope not to do any layoffs. And again, we have to see what Washington does because everything will be a factor of that. Uh, in terms of opening guidelines for businesses, uh, they are set. You can find them on the website. 
They apply to every business across the state. It's one set of rules. There are no different rules for New York City than there are for Buffalo, than there are for Albany. Uh, I want to be able to say to every New Yorker, uh, I believe it is safe to reopen. I believe it's safe for my kids. I believe it's safe for your kids. And we don't change what is safe from one place to another. So there are no different rules for New York City. You mentioned public transit. Is there a threshold that the MTA thinks of amount of riders that's safe? And what is the plan to reopen public transit? Temperature checks, reserved rides, and what will you do budget-wise without congestion pricing? Yeah, the budget is going to be a problem. But the federal government, part of the funding from Washington is for the MTA, right? That has nothing to do with congestion pricing. Uh, and the MTA is going to have a full reopening plan. Socially distancing on buses, subways is not really that possible. That's why the reopening is K, uh, gauged to metrics on the drop in the virus, because you can't really say to people, the virus is still raging, get back on the subway, get back on the buses. Uh, but the, from the cleaning to the disinfecting to stopping the hours uh, during the night, which for a few hours to disinfect the trains, which I know was controversial, but I think it was right. Those trains have never been cleaner. I think we finally have homeless people getting the care they need rather than sleeping in subway cars, which is long, long overdue for every New Yorker, including for the homeless. Uh, so I think that was all very smart, and they'll have a full reopening plan ready to, to coincide with the economic reopening that we announced. Who didn't ask a question? Anyone didn't ask a question? Yes. Um, the partnership with Chris Rock and Rosa Perez, what does that mean for New Yorkers, and what exactly are they going to be doing? They are going to use their voice, their skill, their talent to communicate better than I have. Uh, and they're going to be doing an ad that we're going to run uh, from New York State to communicate to New Yorkers just what they said to you today, how important it is to do the testing uh, and wear the PPE and how it's part of our social responsibility and it's also smart for individuals. You want to add anything to that, Chris? Rosie? I would just like to say that in regards to his executive order that I'm so happy to hear about, about authorizing private small businesses to um, have someone leave if they're not wearing a mask, if we can have that precedent um, uh, 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 made, it's going to lessen also the anxiety of going into a store. It's going to lessen, hopefully, the fights that are breaking out in stores when someone sees someone without a mask. It's just there's enough fear that's going around. And wearing a mask, like we've been stating, is not just about respecting you, yourself, or your, your, your community and your fellow neighbors, but it's, it's also respecting the, the store owners. And it's also decreasing the anxiety, because what's coming out of this pandemic what a lot of people uh, don't talk about, what the governor does talk about, is also the mental illness ramifications of all of this. When you see people lose their temper inside the stores, it's just because everyone's on their last nerves. Getting tested, wearing a mask, practicing social distancing, washing your hands will decrease all of those anxieties. And giving the stores those, that authorization, I think is, I hope, I, I hope and pray that it's a positive step forward so that we don't have to see these crazy YouTube and Instagram videos of people just losing their mind. Yeah, if I can add, Rosie's exactly right. Uh, and I share that thinking 100%. I think this will reduce conflicts. Look, it's the one thing you don't wear a, a mask and you're walking down the sidewalk. That's one situation. You don't wear a mask and you walk into a small retail store and now you're exposing people to you without a mask, uh, and they're surprised by this, and they're in a smaller confined space, that is a conflict uh, waiting to erupt, right? So you don't want to wear a mask, stay on the sidewalk, don't socially stay within, uh, try to stay within uh, the social distancing guidelines, but if you go in a store, and you know you're going to expose other people. You have to wear a mask. 
And you're right. That's where you'll see real conflicts. For Rosie and Chris, what do you see? What do you see in your neighborhoods in terms of mask wearing? Well, in Brooklyn, I'm seeing probably 40 percent people wearing masks. You know, just it, it's the kids really aren't wearing a mask, and um, you know, it, it's it's sad. It's sad that it's become that our health has become, you know, a sort of political issue, you know. It's almost, a, you know, it's a status symbol almost to not wear a mask. Yeah. What are you hoping to accomplish through this partnership? I'm just hoping to help, you know. I, I have complete trust in the governor, and, you know, we're, we're soldiers for New York. This is, you know, it's a, you know, it's a hundred thousand dead Americans, and I will go wherever, you know, I'm called. People speak out in the neighborhood, self-policing within the community, people giving others a hard time if they're not wearing You masks. see that a little bit. You see that a little bit. But most people, you know, New York, try to mind their business. Yeah. Have you spoken out to, to other people in the neighborhood? About no, not really? I haven't. I, I, I give a, a nice side eye. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I try to bring some levity into the equation and I say, hey, do the right thing, put your mask yeah. on, come on people. Um, but you know, I also see what, what really boggles my mind, you know, we talk about how um, uh, the uh, communities of color, uh, communities of low income and poor, when you step into the communities that are affluent, uh, where you see hipsters and yuppies walking around without a mask, I, I go, what is it? Is it arrogance? Is, is it an arrogant, defiant act that you're doing? Do you think that you are not going to be affected? Okay, fine, that's your thing, but you're affecting me too. And, and that I really do not understand. And people are not talking about that. You know, we're encouraging Latinos and African Americans to wear a mask, you know, that are, come from, you know, low income communities. Well, you know what? Everyone needs to get on board. Everyone, put your arrogance aside, put your ego aside, you know, and come together. The governor said it's about humanity. You know, so if anything that I could do, be a cheerleader, let Chris tell a few jokes to get people put a mask on, we will do whatever we can to be part of this campaign. Yeah, also just to reinforce Rose's point. This is, uh, this is predominantly an issue with younger people. I think part of it is the way this, this was communicated initially. It was initially communicated, don't worry if you're a young person, this is only about old people and young people won't get it. Uh, that turned out not to be 100% true, but I think that was the first message that went out there. I remember there was a, a video that went all over the place about a, a young guy who was in Florida partying and he's on the video and he says, uh, yes, coronavirus, uh, Young guys don't get it, only old people get it. I'm not going to let it stop me from partying. I'm going to go when they were partying down on the Florida beach. And now he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> you can't find that video anymore. But I think that's the way it came out. And uh, so part of this is correcting that. And it is, it's not just one community or another. I think it's young people all across the board, you know. Uh, and plus they're young, you know, they're superheroes. They're Superman, Superwoman, nothing can affect them. And even, which is not true, but even if it were true, you can kill your mother, your father, or your grandparents, or whoever you happen to come across. Let's take one more, because they have to get to work. Right now, I New York City has the same amount of Just deaths. Me, anyone didn't ask a question? Okay, go New ahead. York City has a mix of confirmed and probable deaths, which is now about the same as the amount that New York State is reporting in total. The city managed to come up with a tally of confirmed and probable deaths. Does New York State have any plan to do the same so that New Yorkers can understand really overall what uh, an impact this has had on our state? Yeah, just so we're clear, some states, different places do it differently all across the country, but they're two different numbers, right? Confirmed death is confirmed death, and then there's another calculus which is probable, but we're not sure. Uh, and we'll tell you when we find out. That's probable. So they're two different numbers. 
Uh, do you know, Melissa, on our count, which one do we provide? The city provides the probable and the confirmed, and the nursing homes um, are reported the probable and the confirmed. And to provide the probable death number. For I'll have to check with DOH about that. And I think it's only 10 states in the country are currently providing probable and confirmed. So as the governor said, this is an uneven accounting. Even when you look state to state, I think everyone needs to consider that when they're doing the state to state comparisons. But I'll check in with DOH and we'll get back to you. Yeah. Because the probable, you know, you know, confirmed death means confirmed. I don't know what really probable means. Okay. Thank you all very much. Chris, thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you. Now he's dead. Terrible. <laughs> 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 Let's take one picture like this. <laughs>